and I want to thank you uh, for tuning in and uh, continuing to watch these videos. Uh, we are from the North Texas Church of Christ. Uh, our building is physically located at 1290 FM 407 uh, here in North Lake, uh, in North Lake, Texas. Uh, again, I want to remind you that if you have any questions uh, or any doubts or um, about anything, not just these Bible studies, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email at minister at ntxcoc.com. That's minister at ntxcoc.com, all lowercase. Again, if you want notes from this Bible class or you have any more questions or anything that you didn't understand, uh, please uh, send me an email and we'd be more than happy to answer that. Uh, we want to invite you to our physical Bible classes uh, if you want uh, to do that. Uh, our physical Bible classes start at Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. and our worship service uh, starts at 10.30 a.m. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in and continuing uh, to watch these Bible studies. Uh, we are going uh, through the letter of James uh, together. Uh, so we are up to James chapter 1, uh, verses 12 uh, through 14. As you'll notice, uh, some of these videos are a little bit longer uh, some, uh, th than others. And that's just because as you follow uh, the context and, and you're go when we're going through James, some of the thoughts that James puts together, some of them are very long and very complicated, and some of them are kind of simple and don't require very, very, many, very much exp explaining. But uh, that said, uh, again, if you have any questions or you have any, any issues, that you see there that maybe we didn't explore together, please uh, shoot me an email I'll be, and I'll be more than glad uh, to put out a video on that. Uh, so today we're going to be looking uh, just at, for just a few minutes, at chapter 1 of James, verses 12 uh, through 14. And uh, James says, if you have your Bible or you want to follow along with me or you just want to listen, uh, listen, the Word of God says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation." Because when he has been tried, he will receive the crown of life, which he has promised to the ones who love him. Let no one who is tempted say, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Each one is tempted when he is lured by his own desires and enticed. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it bears death. This entire life, our entire life, the entire time that we are here on earth, it is a test to prepare us for the next life. Now, I know that there is a lot of people out there that don't believe that there is a next life coming. Um, and to those folks, I want to say, 
that that's a terrible way to live life. It, it means that there is no point to anything that we're doing. Right? But that's not true for Christians. Because we believe that there is a next life coming. We believe uh, that how we live our life while we're here on this earth matters. And that's what James is alluding to. That's what he's saying. Right? I say the next life, but it's not really the next life because it's the same life. Because this life that we have, we're going to continue it into eternity. Because you and I, as human beings, we are eternal creatures. And like I said before, I know that there's something, some folks out there that don't believe this, but some things can be true whether you believe in them or not. And you and I, we are eternal creatures. Since we are born, we will live forever. We will. The only question is where. How we live our lives during this chapter, the present chapter, determines where we will live our eternity. As we live for God, James is very has this very present in his life especially as he's writing this letter. As we live for God, there's going to be one temptation after another, especially, especially if we're trying to live our life for God. If we're trying, doing our best to serve God and we are living our Christian life and we're making a sincere effort, let me tell you that Satan is not going to be happy with that and he's going to come after us because he wants to rip us away from the side of God. He wants us to destroy our relationship with God. He does. And he does it in big ways and he does it in, in little ways. And all of those different ways are called temptations. And as we live this life, there's going to be one temptation after another. James is reminding us in these short little verses, right, in this thought, he's reminding us that there is a crown waiting for us, that there is a reward waiting for us that are doing our best to live our life for God. The crown of life comes only after we pass the test. You know, the first time I read this particular letter, these verses really kind of struck me. You know, kind of like when you get hit in the face with cold water. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, but let me tell you, it's pretty shocking, right? It kind of wakes you up if you're asleep or, you know, it's, it's just, and that's what it's supposed to do. And that's what these verses did for me the first time that I really paid attention to what, what James is saying here. They struck me because James here explains to us exactly where sin comes from. You know, I've always heard the saying, I don't know exactly where it comes from, uh, but I've heard the saying, knowing is half the battle. And so I think that knowing where sin comes from is going to help us in order not to land in, not, not to, not to fall into so many temptations and to be more aware of the things that can tear us away from God. Right? James is very explicitly telling us exactly how it is that we fall into temptation and then into sin because those are two very different things and he makes the distinction here in these verses first he reminds us that temptation does not originate from god god cannot be tempted and he in turn does not tempt anyone else but we already talked about that in the first part of this letter that was about two or three videos ago we already talked about that and then he says that when we are tempted it's because of our own desires. He uses the word lured. You know, I when I when I hear that word lure, I think of fishing. Right? Because you put a lure on the end of your fishing rod in order to lure fish to it so you can grab them and you can rip them out of the water. So lure doesn't have a very good connotation. Um it's like when you're laying a trap for an animal. You want that animal to come into the trap because you want to capture them. You want to imprison them. You want to destroy them, right? It being, being lured is not a good thing. It's not a good word. But that is exactly what Satan does with temptations. He puts beautiful things, wonderful things in front of us that we know sometimes are going to lure us away from God because he wants us to be trapped. 
He wants us to walk away from our relationship with God. Let me tell you that this is something that Satan has done all through history. He did it since the beginning. Remember what Satan did to Eve? If you go back and read the creation story, you're going to see that Satan did not make anyone do anything. Like I said, when I went back and read these stories, it just kind of hit me because the the one thing that we always want to do as human beings, uh, when we make a mistake, when we commit a sin, is we always want to blame someone else. We always want to say, well, it was her fault. It was his fault. It was their fault. And they weren't doing what they were supposed to. And they weren't doing this. And we always try and place blame on someone else. And then what we do, and then another thing that we do is we try and hide the things that we do. And we try and justify our behavior, right? But James is very explicit in telling us, hey, it's nobody's fault if you commit a sin. As a matter of fact, he says, it's kind of your own fault. And if you go all the, back, all the way back to the creation story, like I was saying, you will see that Satan didn't make Adam and Eve do anything. What he did do was place a temptation right in front of them. He sowed the seed of doubt in Eve. And he let Eve make the decision on her own of what to do. You can see exactly there is an illustration of what temptation and trial and testing is all about. See, because he pl he, he placed that doubt in Eve's in, in Eve's mind and Eve's heart. He said, you know, God, what God doesn't want you to do is God doesn't want you to be like him, Eve. He doesn't want you to know the the what's good and what's bad. No, no, he he doesn't want you to be like him. He wants you to keep you down. And Eve fell into that temptation. He keeps doing the same thing to us. He says, you're a Christian. You shouldn't have to suffer this much. Doesn't God love you? Why is God not taking care of you? Why doesn't God answer your prayers exactly like you want him to? I mean, doesn't he love you? Have those thoughts ever entered into your head? Now, we're going to deal with some of those issues later on in the letter of James, but let me tell you that that's not God, and that's those, those thoughts are not godly. That is Satan putting doubt into your heart about you and your relationship with God. He continues to do the same thing to us that he did to Adam and he did to Eve, and he's done all throughout history. Because Satan and the world will appeal to our desires and the things that we consider important in our lives sometimes, and he will use those things to try and lure us away from, from God. It is up to us to decide to follow those things or not. James says sometimes we're lured and sometimes we're enticed. Enticed is another one of those words that doesn't have a very good connotation for a good reason. Because we're lured and we're trapped by our own desires. When that happens, according to James in the scripture that we read, sin is birthed into our lives. It's an interesting analogy that James uses to talk about the origin of sin. James uses the analogy of childbirth to describe exactly how sin is conceived and is grown and delivered into our lives. A very good, um, a very good analogy about that is, is maybe anger, right? Because anger doesn't start as anger. No, it, it starts as so, somebody wronging you, and then you don't deal with that right away, and then you let it fester. You let it fester in your heart, and eventually, the, eventually that becomes anger. Eventually that becomes bitterness, and eventually it starts um, destroying other relationships. And it has nothing to do with other people, but it has to do with you and that person that wronged you. And because we're not willing to deal with that, it has eventually birthed into something else into our lives. See, that's what happens. That's what James is talking about, that that's what sin does. That's what it originates. It originates in our own desires. In that case, your own desire to get justice or to get someone back, right? It moves you and it takes you to do something wrong, to do something maybe to hurt somebody else. But it didn't start with the action. No, it started in your heart. It started in our heart. That's what James is talking about. And of course, the ultimate result of not being able to stop sin in our lives is being, it, it, sin is being birthed in death. James is talking about the ultimate consequences here. He's not saying, and I want to make this clear, uh, he is not saying that every sin that we commit results in spiritual death. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the inability to deal with sin, 
the inability to recognize when we're falling into temptation and when we're allowing sin to slowly take over our lives, when the inability to deal with sin is eventually going to result in eternal death for us. So we need to be careful about not only falling into temptation, but not allowing that temptation to take root in our lives and not allowing that temptation to give birth uh, to action in our lives and become sin. Because then it not only becomes sin, then it can become habitual in our lives and then it can become an entire lifestyle. And then it's going to start affecting our relationships and then it's going to affect our relationship with God. And it's going to result in eternal death. That's what James is talking about. Deal with it before it becomes that. So he gives us the entire process. He says you're presented with a temptation and something that you desire and you recognize that. And then you start planning how to get that thing that you desire. And sometimes it's not very ethical. It's not very moral. It's not very Christian, the things that we do to obtain that thing that we desire. And that's when sin comes into our lives. He says, so when we see the temptation and we start feeling that desire, that's the time to act. That's the time that we need to remind ourselves of, ourselves of who we are in God, who Jesus is, and deal with it then before it becomes full-blown sin in our lives. But even if it does become full-blown sin in our lives, how do we deal with that? Well, folks, we come back to Jesus. Jesus has given us a, an amazing gift in the sacrifice that, that, that he, he, and the things that he went through for us. He shed his blood for us. And according to 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, he says that if we are faithful and we confess our sins to him, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. And he's not talking about just that one-time commitment that we make to Jesus and we become, we, we're baptized, we, we, we're immersed into Christ and we start a relationship with him. No, he's talking about these continual temptations, this continual sin sometimes that we allow to come into our lives. Because the moment that you realize that there's something going on in your life that you don't need to be there, that you don't want it there, that you know shouldn't be there, he says, you come to Christ, you come to Jesus, you confess it to him, and he is faithful. To forgive it because the blood of Christ constantly showers us and constantly forgives us. What a wonderful scripture that is in 1 John chapter 1 that reminds us that no matter how many times we fall into temptation, if we remember who we belong to and we remember that we need to call out to Christ, He will continue to forgive us. It's an amazing gift that we have in the blood of Christ. It's an amazing gift that God has given us in His Son. So remember, give it to Jesus. I want to remind you that if you have something in your life, we would love to help you give that over to Christ. If you have something that has been weighing your heart down, if you have something in your life that has been preventing you from being the Christian that you know you can be, or that God wants you to be, why let that go on? Why let that go on any longer? Let us help you. Give me, send me an email and let me know what you're struggling with and I will pray for you and I will come out and visit you and I will let you know that Jesus still loves you, that he died for you, that he wants to forgive you if you would only give him the opportunity. Thank you for joining us today. Again, I would like to invite you physically to our services on Sunday morning which start at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 10.30 a.m. Uh, for worship services. God bless you, and thank you for tuning in.